Good afternoon. So as we move out of winter and into warm months, can anyone tell me what kind of uh, viruses are going to be prevalent during the warm months as opposed to the winter? Well, let's, what did we have in the winter? What kind of viruses? Flu? Anything else? Sorry? Rhinoviruses. Okay, what about what's going to come up in the summer months? Remember? Polio. Of course, we don't have it anymore. But if we did, if we did here, that would be time for polio, right? Anything else? I don't think I told you anything else. West Nile, because the mosquitoes are coming. Uh, uh, that's right. Any mosquito-borne uh, viral disease will become more prevalent in the summer. We don't have a lot in the U.S., but there are a number of flavy viruses and other vector-borne viruses. Anybody seen um, the press lately has been reporting about a mosquito-borne virus that was supposedly sexually transmitted? Anybody seen this? No? Guys, don't, don't you look at the news? <laughs> Every major news online has got this virus transmitted by sexual activity. It's supposed to be a mosquito-borne virus. No. Okay. Well, this was a kind of exotic virus from Africa, which is mosquito-borne, and uh, this this um, I think the guy was working there, and he came home, and uh, I think his wife was home. And then he, he developed symptoms, and then she did, and they both got infected. And the idea is that it was transmitted sexually. So there's a, a study, a clinical study of two, right? And so every newspaper I've looked at has sexually transmitted virus in the headlines. So it's really amazing. This is what I'm trying to correct by teaching this course. So if any of you become journalists, you have to read the paper. Because in this case, if you read the paper, it says, we cannot prove that transmission was sexual, but it's conditions suggest that it might be. But every journalist just takes the headline and says sexually transmitted infection. So this really bothers me because they don't read the papers. They don't have time, I understand. But now the whole country is thinking that this virus is sexually transmitted. All right, so that's screwed up. All right, now that I'm finished ranting about that, let's talk about vaccines. Anybody here been immunized against the virus infection? You haven't been? Yes, you have. Has anyone not been immunized? Yeah, that's uh, more likely. So you're in the age group that you are all immunized. And vaccines are what we're going to talk about today because that's, vaccination is a form of immunization. And uh, as you know, as we've talked about throughout this course, there are lots of viruses impinging on this all the time. And they're always one step ahead of us. So is it possible that we can get ahead of them? Can we get the upper hand? Can we do something to supp supplement our natural defenses? Indeed, could we even eradicate a virus from the planet? Has any virus been eradicated? Do you know? Yes. It's the only one that's been eradicated, and we're working on polio. So today we'll talk about vaccines, and then next time we'll talk about antivirals. These are our two ways that we try and uh, intervene in the virus-host interaction on a population scale. Vaccines and drugs can be really effective, but as, as you are beginning to understand from this course, the virus-host interaction is pretty complicated. And sometimes you can't intervene without affecting things in unknown ways. And in fact, even though we have an entire course on virology, what we don't know is humbling. When we test vaccines we, and drugs, we find out how little, in fact, we know. Vaccines that work in the lab fail in the field. Resistant mutants arise. Drugs have unexpected side effects, which you don't find in small animal studies or small human studies. People refuse to take their medicines is a big problem. Or societies can't pay or won't use good medicines. So these last two are non-scientific issues. You can have the best vaccines or antivirals, but if people won't take them or pay for them, they're not going to ever be effective. So both vaccines and antiviral drugs have a common principle, uh, and that is, first, any way to block virus replication always imposes selection for viruses that bypass the block. This is without exception. If you impinge in some way on viruses replication, it, they will evolve to get around that. 
you will have resistant mutants, vaccine escape mutants, and even selection for increased virulence sometimes. And we'll talk about examples of all of these. As you know, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. To inhibit viral replication always carries inherent risks for the hosts. And these are the so-called side effects of mainly antiviral therapy, which we will talk about next time. Nevertheless, despite all these problems, vaccines are our best defense against viruses. As you can see by this life expectancy graph, from about 1900 to the present, uh, virus vaccines as well as antibiotics and other uh, health measures, health care measures, have increased our life expectancy amazingly. Look at this from uh, 50 years or less in 1900 to now the, the females get the longer life expectancy, 80 years old. If you're born in um, 2010 and, and you are a female, you should live to be about 80 years or so of age. Does anyone know what this decrease was in 1918? Yeah, this is the effect of the pandemic of influenza, 1918-1919, a, a decrease in the, the uh, life expectancy. And so this is a consequence of, of vaccines and many other medicines. It's really striking. And I don't know how one can argue, and many people do, that vaccines have not been useful when you have results such as these. Vaccination, of course, engages the immune response that you already have to prevent virus infections, and it also engages memory system, as we will see. The key concept in using vaccines is that we break the transmission cycle of host to host spread. So a virus has to go from host to host to maintain itself in a population. And by immunizing with vaccines, we break this chain of transmission. And they do so by stimulating a protective immune response, by mimicking an infection and providing memory. So here is, again, I think we've seen this before, a typical immune response. We're looking on the y-axis at antibody or T cells that are produced. The, uh, uh, the um, adaptive immune response. And then we have our first infection, and starting at about seven days, we have the initial response. It can be antibodies or cells, which matures in about two weeks and then declines with time. So you don't have the effector cells present at high levels in the blood for long periods. They're there at low levels, and they persist for a long time. And during that time, you have protective immunity. When you are challenged again with the pathogen, you have stimulation of immunological mem memory. So the memory remains from the initial infection. And you have a very rapid, much more rapid than the initial response, as you can see, and more robust response. So this is what protects you. This is immunological memory. And vaccines attempt to duplicate this. But of course, they are not always perfect at doing so. And that's what we'll talk about today. The concept that vaccines stimulate immune memory comes from a lot of experimental findings. One of the earliest is an experiment, or an observation, I should say, done in the Faroe Islands, which are just north of the United Kingdom, uh, which were for many years remote and isolated uh, because there were no airplanes to get there. There were just boats. So for example, in 1781, there was an outbreak of measles on these islands, and this is documented in the health records. For the next 65 years, the island was free of measles, presumably because everyone was immunized and there was no more virus brought to the island. There was an outbreak in 1846, presumably a ship docked at the island and someone brought in measles virus. Yet in that outbreak, none of those who survived the 1781 epidemic, it's many years for, for this era, but some did, none of those individuals were infected. They had immune memory. So this was the first demonstration of immune memory. A natural experiment demonstrating immune memory. It lasts a long time and should be maintained without re-exposure to a virus. There are a number of immunologists who believe that we always have uh, challenges to our immune system that stimulate the longevity of memory. But I don't, I don't think there's good evidence for that. I think you don't need to have any pathogen present. The immune memory lasts on its own. So again, vaccines attempt to do this. What is immune memory? It's essentially special kinds of T and B lymphocytes, memory cells that remain after the infection is over. 
And as we've seen in the graph, these have an enhanced ability to proliferate rapidly and to great extents after infection. And the concept of vaccines is that they establish this memory without making you sick, without the pathogenic effects that are typically seen when you have your first encounter with uh, any virus. All right, so you have to design a vaccine so it doesn't make you sick, yet it protects you and elicits memory. And memory is the main component of a vaccine because you're usually not challenged with the pathogen until some time after you are immunized. So we're depending on memory for protection. Nowadays, in, in developed countries, vaccines are an integral part of our existence. We immunize children, we immunize adults of all ages, even animals. We immunize many of our domestic, of course, our pets, our dogs and our cats and we immunize farm animals as well. And as a consequence, many childhood diseases are rare. When I was growing up, we used to always get measles and mumps and rubella, and that's absent. We don't get that any longer. This has radical changes in societies and populations. By doing this and preventing disease, you can make societies more productive and, and more easily learning, for example. So these are a major part of the first world's public health measures now, but not the third world yet. And we strive to do that, but it hasn't yet happened. So let's look at a little history of, of uh, vaccination. The first, the first credit for the vaccine, of course, is given to Edward Jenner, who developed a vaccine against smallpox in, 19, in 1796. And Jenner noticed that milkmaids who milked cows and got cowpox lesions on their hands usually didn't get smallpox. So he thought maybe cowpox and smallpox are related. And so he actually took a cowpox lesion and rubbed it into a skin of a young boy and that boy was then protected against smallpox. The smallpox vaccine was then developed and it was used for many, many years. It's delivered by scraping the virus into the outer layers of your skin using this bifurcated needle. It holds a little drop of fluid with virus in it, the vaccine virus. You scrape it into the outer layers. It multiplies very well there and gives you immune memory. And this is the vaccine that was used to eradicate smallpox. It's a very low-tech delivery. It can be delivered by untrained health personnel, and it was very uh, easy to use. Now, this whole, this is, this whole uh, immunization approach was actually used many, many years before. There are historical records which showed, for example, you know, older Chinese societies used what was called scarification to try and prevent smallpox. They would take a, a pustule from a smallpox person, grind it up, and scrape it into someone else's skin. And that, of course, is problematic because they're using wild-type virus, and so a lot of the people would die. But a number would be protected, and that was felt to be worthwhile. In fact, in the U.S., during the revolutionary period, Small, there were epidemics of smallpox, and many individuals took their chances at being scarified, but with wild-type virus, because that was 20 years before Jenner's vaccine, rather than have, take a chance on the virus killing you, because it can be lethal. Uh, the next vaccine was developed by Louis Pasteur in 1885, the rabies vaccine, and he introduced the, tame, the term vaccination into the literature. And it comes from cow, the Latin word for cow, vaca, in honor of Jenner, who used cowpox as the first vaccine. And then we didn't have many vaccines until the 1930s, when we then developed yellow fever and influenza virus uh, vaccines. So there's some big gaps here in the early years. The use of, of large-scale vaccination campaigns can be helpful, can be very successful. This is an example of two. Here on the top is a polio large-scale vaccination campaign in the US. So polio rose in incidence in the U.S. from the 40s to the 50s, where it peaked at about 20 to 30,000 cases per year. In 1954, the inactivated vaccine was developed and introduced. And as you can see, that had a dramatic impact on the incidence of polio. We then introduced an oral vaccine in 1961, and now polio has been eradicated from the U.S. Same with measles. Here, uh, the incidence of measles per 100,000 population here on the y-axis. The vaccine introduced in the 1960s dramatically impaired the, the spread of measles in the US. 
as well as that late sequelae, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which happens many years after the initial measles. These are the number of SSP cases in the US reported. So in the peak, 50 to 60 cases. These are invariably fatal. Uh, and all of those were eliminated as well. I shouldn't say all of them because we still have some measles in the US because there are individuals who do not immunize their children because they believe vaccines are harmful or, or something else. And so we have pockets of susceptible individuals. This, this often happens in groups, in communities. So you have a lot of susceptible children. And there are outbreaks because there's a lot of measles virus and it can be readily introduced into these communities. So here are two important ideas about how vaccines do and don't work. First of all, there's the concept of herd immunity, which is often misinterpreted. Uh, it, it means that you immunize enough people to block virus spread. You don't immunize everyone. You immunize a fraction for whatever reason. And those who don't get the vaccine are still protected. Not necessarily because they get infected by the virus spreading through the population, but just because you immunize enough people to stop the spread of virus. So there has to be a critical number of susceptibles, and if you get that, you can stop virus spread. Not everyone has to be immune to protect the population. In fact, that's good because we can never immunize 100%, especially here in the US. You have to also maintain a critical level of immunity in those individuals who do get immunized. And if, if the immunity falls below a, cr a critical level, you will get epidemics, even if you have a very good vaccine. So you have to have enough people with sufficient immunity to block transmission in a population. This enough people is complicated. It differs according to the virus, the population that we're talking about, the, even the environment, economics, the health care infrastructure, social issues, belief. All of these can impinge upon what is enough people to stop transmission of a virus. But um, basically, herd immunity says that when virus spread will stop when the probability of infection drops below a critical threshold. And that, again, is virus and population specific. For smallpox, you need to have 80 to 85 percent of the population to have sufficient immunity, enough immunity, in order to prevent spread. So you don't have to immunize everyone. For measles, it's higher. You have to have 93 to 95 percent of the population immunized to stop virus spread. Now, the problem is that no vaccine is 100% effective. So even if you could immunize 100% of the population, you wouldn't get 100% immunity. And the number varies, but it's rarely over 90%. For example, the flu vaccine is well below 90% in its efficacy. Even if you, if you immunize 100 people, only 70 to 80 will actually be protected, depending on the year and the vaccine. So, for example, with the measles vaccine, when you immunize 80% of the population, only 76% are actually immune, which is not bad. It's a pretty good vaccine. It's better than the influenza vaccine. All right, so these are just two examples, smallpox and measles. Every vaccine has its own number. And a big problem, of course, is public complacency uh, to any vaccine program. And here are some phrases that we hear all the time for people not getting immunized. So why didn't you get the flu vaccine this year? Why didn't I get it? It's not on the list. I don't have time this year. Actually, I never get flu. Is that on the list? Yes, here it is, number three. But I'm right because I worked on it and I got infected with every possible strain. <laughs> you should say you're wrong because you can't, because it varies infinitely and I can't have possibly done that. Viral diseases are a thing of the past. Kids should get infected naturally. There's a good one. I've heard that many times. I'm not injecting anything into my body. And all the things that vaccines do, they make you sick, they cause autism, MS. Here you go. I, this is a very popular one. I know a guy who got the flu shot and then got the flu. Well, of course, it takes about two to three weeks to get your immunity kicked in, right? So you could get the flu right after getting the flu shot. But if you got an inactivated flu vaccine, you wouldn't be getting the flu from it. But that's what some people feel. Anyway, when these attitudes prevail, then we have a problem with large-scale programs. And right now we have a problem because the anti-vaccine um, sentiment in this country is quite strong and growing. 
and it's all based on misinformation. And it's really unfortunate because people are not getting information from scientists because they don't trust us in part. But they get information from journalists and lawyers and other individuals who really don't know with the science behind immunization, that there's nothing dangerous about vaccines, that there's nothing bad to put into your body, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a really pr big problem. And a lot of our childhood infections, measles, mumps, are coming back because of, of this complacency. It's not just a complacency. It's an active opposition against immunization. And there are many variables that uh, influence how immunization proceeds, very, very complicated variables, poverty, social structure, infrastructure, and politics. Uh, all of these, even in the richest countries in the world, affect public health. In developing countries, they're often simply out of the question. People can't even find clean water to drink on a daily basis, so a vaccine is a luxury. And you need money to do these large-scale programs. Now, the large-scale polio eradication program costs billions of dollars, and fortunately, Bill Gates is providing a large amount of that to proceed. And of course, right now, our economy is bad, so these are never popular in those cases. And then there are people who just don't like large social programs. I don't have to tell you who they are, but they don't like immunization programs, which is silly. It has nothing to do with your philosophy about social programs. It's about keeping people healthy. And as I've said, the Gates Foundation has taken a major lead. They've provided money not only for polio, but also for providing hepatitis B vaccine. And this is great. We need more people that were willing to do this and take the money they've made from society and invest it into making health care. My philosophy is that if we develop something that prolongs people's lives, like a vaccine, everyone should be able to benefit from it. It shouldn't be restricted by the cost, for example. Okay, let's talk about how to make a vaccine. Did I just skip? Yes, okay, how to make a vaccine. So you have to make a good immune response, as we have said, and sometimes you have to make calculations. So for example, the Th1 and Th2 response in many infections has to be properly balanced, and we talked a little bit about that. Vaccines have to mimic that. The gold standard is that a vaccinated individual has to be protected against the pathogen that causes disease. Making antibodies is not enough. You can't just inject a vaccine into people and say, hey, they make antibodies, that's fine. You have to show that the vaccine induces protection. So that requires a complicated clinical trial. <clears throat> Vaccines can be active or passive. An active va vaccine is that you put the pathogen or material derived from it into the recipient, and this gives you long-term protection. So these are most of the vaccines we're going to talk about today. A passive vaccine, you put the products of the immune response into the person. You put antibodies or immune cells that you get from another individual. This gives you short-term protection, but sometimes you don't have any choice. And the, a good example is rabies. There's a product called rabies immune globulin, which um, is basically antibodies against rabies virus. It used to be pooled human sera uh, from people who had had rabies, and it was purified so as not to be pathogenic. And if someone is bitten by a rabid animal, uh, you give them this initially to help delay the spread of the virus. And here is, here is a product sheet from one of these uh, more recent one, rabies immune globulin. Um, so this is, these are some of the US brand names here. It's given along with the vaccine to prevent infection caused by uh, rabies virus. And this gives you protection until you, your antibodies can kick in. So if you get bitten by a dog, for example, and there's suspected rabies, the immune globulin is injected at the bite site to help neutralize the virus, and then you get immunized as well on top of it. So now there are monoclonal antibodies that are produced, humanized monoclonal antibodies that are produced so we don't have to use uh, human sera. Uh, a passive vaccine occurs when you are born. You get antibodies from your mother. Uh, so here is a course of development from conception through birth and adult years. This is the fraction of adult uh, antibody levels of different kinds, IgM, IgG, and IgA. Um, and initially, you receive antibodies from, from your mother, as you can see here. 
This is passively transferred maternal IgG. And they, they, of course, peak at birth. You can't get any more from your mom after you're born. Uh, but then you, they slowly decline in the, the child's blood. By nine months, they're gone. And then they are replaced by your own IgM, IgG, and IgA. So as you become in, assaulted with various pathogens, uh, you develop your own immune response. So you can't make one in utero, so your mother provides you with some protection. And you depend on your mother's experience for this. The more infections she has had, the more antibodies you will get. So that's a natural passive antibody. What are the requirements for a good vaccine? It has to be safe, of course. It can't cause disease or it can't have side effects that don't have anything to do with the disease. They have to induce protective immunity in the population. And as I said, not everybody needs to be immunized again. Yes? I was wondering, does the child, I mean, does the fetus develop memory cells from being affected by the mom's disease? No, no, they don't receive memory cells, just antibodies from the mom. And then those decline eventually, and you make your own memory cells as you have infection experiences. Yeah. As, as I said, herd immunity is important, so your vaccine has to induce herd immunity. The protection has to be long-lasting, and this is not assumed. You can't assume that any vaccine you made is going to be long-lasting. Some last forever, and some last a few years. And the key is to optimize the vaccine to make it as long-lasting as possible. It also should be cheap. WHO says the ideal vaccine for its purposes is less than $1 a dose, which is a challenge. But it has been done. Polio, the polio vaccine being used for eradication costs about five cents a dose. So you can get it quite cheap when you make a lot. It has to be genetically stable. We'll talk about that. Storage would be great if you didn't have to refrigerate or freeze your vaccines. Many of them do require freezing right now. But a whole new generation of vaccines are being develop, is being developed that don't have to be frozen. They're really amazing stabilization agents that are being used. And how it's delivered is really important. And traditionally, all our vaccines have been injected. We now have more that can be taken orally, but that's not appropriate for every pathogen. But again, this is changing too. I've read recently about a kind of patch that you would put on your skin. It's impregnated with vaccine. And the patch has tiny, tiny, not needles, but tiny protuberances in it that push the vaccine into your skin. You just wear it for a few days and you get immunized. You don't need a physician to do that. You can just put it on your skin yourself. So these are the vaccines of the future. So let's talk about some of the ways we make vaccines today. They're all shown here, starting with a parental virus. Uh, we'll talk about a, a couple of these. The, the, we can attenuate its virulence to make a, what we call a live natural virus vaccine. Now, we, we use the term live vaccines, even though we know that viruses are not living because it's been ensconced in the literature. And rather than changing every slide, I got live on here. But what I mean is infectious, not live. So we have infectious attenuated vaccines. We have inactivated virus vaccines. We have subunit vaccines where we take the original virus and break it up. And then we have a whole generation based on recombinant DNA approaches. We can clone the genes for individual viral proteins um, or the entire genome. We can clone antigens in entire viral genomes, live virus vectored vaccines. We can make DNA vaccines where we inject DNA into individuals. And this is also being tested in many ways. And then we can have uh, vaccines where we express individual viral proteins. And sometimes they assemble to form virus particles. And these are called virus-like particle vaccines. We've talked about some of these before. Or you can just simply take individual proteins and make subunit vaccines. So these are the current types of approaches that are being used. But many more are being developed and will be present in the future. So this is a list of almost all of the vaccines that are currently available. Just to give you an idea of the range, there are quite a few, but by no means is every virus included in this list. Uh, for example, we have adenovirus vaccines, which are just used for the military because they're particularly susceptible in closed conditions to having rampant respiratory infections. Hepatitis A and B vaccines. In fact, anyone know what's gone on recently with respect to hepatitis B vaccine? No? 
Well, the fellow who discovered the virus just died last week, Baruch Blumberg, right? So he was the guy who, in fact, he graduated from Columbia in 1951 before us. Yeah. And then he, uh, he, he discovered the virus and received the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, a couple of influenza vaccines, both inactivated and attenuated. And then we have measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines, which are all combined together. The papillomavirus vaccines are here, rabies, smallpox, varicella, two different varicella vaccines, yellow fever. Uh, so there you go. That's the, the panoply. And these are just the kinds of vaccines and uh, when they are given, the vaccination schedule. So, you know, some of the anti-vaccine people say, oh, kids get dozens and dozens of vaccines. There's too many antigens. It's not healthy. Well, there's not dozens of dozens of vaccines. These are, these are not all childhood vaccines. So it's, again, more misinformation because people don't check their facts and they hear, oh, dozens. Yeah, that sounds about right. I'm not going to have my kid immunized. So let's talk about inactivated vaccines first. These are simply viruses that you propagate normally, and then you inactivate their infectivity in a chemical way. You can use formalin, detergents, other chemicals. They're not infectious. But the antigenicity is still there. They will, if injected, make antibodies that protect you and that give you a memory response. Uh, and the first one we'll talk about is a polio inactivated vaccine. Polio, of course, is the virus that causes poliomyelitis. The word poliomyelitis comes from the Greek for polio and itis, which is inflammation in Latin. And in a 1959 textbook of medicine, it was called a common acute viral disease, characterized by brief febrile illness, sore throat, headache, and vomiting, stiffness of neck and back. And many of those you can recognize as nonspecific symptoms caused by cytokine production. In many cases, a lower neuron paralysis develops in the early days of illness. So of course, today it's no longer common and it's not in the medical textbooks anymore. Uh, this is what polio used to do in the US. It used to put many individuals in iron lungs because often the virus would paralyze the breathing muscles. And so the only way was to put an individual in a machine that would breathe for them. Many of these individuals eventually uh, got out after therapy and were able to breathe again. Uh, but U.S. hospitals were often full of these, and now there aren't any left, of course. And one of our presidents, FDR, of course, had polio as well. And uh, because of that, he initiated fundraising that eventually led to the development of both polio vaccines, the March of Dimes. So the inactivated vaccine is poliovirus that is treated with formalin, and that destroys the infectivity uh, of the virus. This vaccine was first tested in 1954. It was developed by Jonas Salk. And this, I find, an amazing clinical trial. It was tested in 1,800,000 children. Half got the vaccine and half got a placebo. And it gave 50% protection, which at the time was great because everyone was scared to death of polio. Uh, and then it was licensed right away and, and began to be used. Unfortunately, uh, what happened next was an interesting commentary on, on immunization. Um, well, first of all, let's look at the headlines that resulted. Uh, this is amazing. These are all the, new, the papers in New York that used to exist back in 1954. And... Um, I think most, there are, most of them are gone, except for the Times and the Post. Uh, but these are amazing headlines. And this gives you an idea of how serious polio was in the US at this time. Unfortunately, um, after releasing the, the vaccine, within 10 days, a lot of the recipients developed polio. Eventually, there were 216 vaccine-associated cases in 94 children and 166 contacts. And there were a number of deaths as well. So you can imagine your parents bring you to be immunized because they're so scared of polio. And then you get polio and you die. The reason was one of the laboratories that made the vaccine, Cutter Labs, uh, didn't do the inactivation properly. And there was live virus or infectious virus in the preparations. And so Cutter Labs, this was actually the first uh, vaccine-related lawsuits that proceeded. They were very publicized. and. Uh, Paul Offit, who is a pediatrician at Penn, thinks this was the beginning of the anti-vaccine sentiment in the US. The public had this huge trust in polio vaccine. And the first polio vaccine released caused polio. So there were 
lots of lawsuits over this, and we're still probably paying for it till this day. And nevertheless, the issue was resolved. Uh, this was, its use was uh, resumed, and from 1955 to 1960, uh, polio fell to about 2,500 cases uh, in the U.S. And if you're interested in this whole incident where the inactivated vaccine actually caused paralysis, Paul Offit wrote a very good book, The Cutter Incident, where he told about how uh, this happened. Yes? Yeah, it's a tough problem, right? Uh, it was a little bit of um, slyness on the part of the public health authorities. It was never admitted that there was a problem publicly. So they did a lot of covering up and hiding. It's all in this book. And uh, there was a period of a few months where the immunization rates were, were very low, but then they resumed again. Yeah. Yes? Does the book talk about what exactly the did wrong? Yes, it talks about what they did wrong. It talks about the lawsuits and all the precedents that were set by this. It's really good. And Paul Offit is a, um, a pediatrician, but he also has developed, he developed one of the rotavirus vaccines that we've talked about also. He's a very strong vaccine proponent, and he's very good at explaining this. Yes? Um, how did they like, Well, that's a very good question. So initially, you do epidemiology, and you say, are the kids that got paralyzed, were they immunized? And right away, you could look at the immunization records and tell that. And then you say, what batch of vaccine did they get? So the vaccine was made by six or seven different manufacturers. So they could trace it back to one or two manufacturers. And then they looked in those lots, and they found infectious virus. So that, that's basically the chain of events that occurred. So these, this vaccine, the inactivated vaccine, works. It's injected. This is an intramuscular injection. And you get antibodies developing in your blood. And so then if you are challenged with polio, which uh, it comes in your mouth and goes to your intestinal tract, the virus replicates in the mucosal surfaces. It gets into the blood. And then at that point, it will encounter the antibodies that have been induced by immunization, and it will be neutralized. So this vaccine prevents the virus from spreading any further, although it doesn't prevent it from replicating in your intestine. So if you're immunized with IPV, you could still replicate polio and shed it and spread it. Okay, so that, that is the, uh, sorry, the inactivated vaccine. And again, introduced 1955 and brought polio down significantly in the U.S. The other inactivated vaccine I want to talk about is the influenza vaccine. Influenza viruses are very different, of course. They're envelope viruses with glycoproteins in the envelope. There are three types of influenza, A, B, and C, and they're antigenically distinct. So you have to immunize against each one if you want to protect against each one. Uh, a and B are the two that we immunize against. They cause the most serious disease. C doesn't cause significant enough disease to re require a vaccine. The inactivated influenza vaccine, why do we have it? Well, because you get about 50,000 deaths per year in the U.S. due to influenza. It's a lot of people dying. And it, it really is, is surprising when people say, you know, flu is not a serious disease. I don't need to be immunized. Well, it's pretty serious for those 50,000 people who died, and how do you know you're not going to be one of them? So I think that's, a, that's one reason to be immunized. So the vaccine is produced in chicken eggs. The virus is inoculated into the vaccine. It grows in the egg, and then they take out the virus and inactivate it with formalin and detergent, disrupt it, and then this is immunized, this is injected into you. There's currently a vaccine uh, produced in cell culture, uh, which is being used in the European Union. So if you have an egg allergy, you shouldn't get flu vaccine grown in eggs. But eventually, this vaccine will come to the US, and then you can get that as well. We make almost 100 million doses a year. Last year, I think we made over 150 million doses. In 2009, that is, when the recent pandemic emerged. So we make a lot of flu doses. It's 60 to 90 percent effective in children and adults below 65 years of age. So 60 percent is not terribly effective. 60 people out of 100 would be protected. So it's not the best vaccine. This is pretty old technology, and we need to improve it. Over 65, it's really, really poor protection, which doesn't even last an entire flu season. If, if you, you're over 65, you get immunized in September, which is typically when you start immunizing, uh, 
by the next January or February, that immunity has probably waned sufficiently that they could get influenza by then. So we need to do some improving here. Uh, what the vaccine does is makes antibodies against the two glycoproteins that are in the virus particle, the HA or the NA, and that is what protects you from infection. The problem with this vaccine is you have to change it every year or two because the viral envelope genes change and therefore we have to select new strains that we think are going to circulate every year and that's done at the beginning of the year and decisions are made because they have to go into production and even starting in January or February getting a vaccine out by August is not easy but that's what happens and then you can start immunizing people in September. The way this is done, because most isolates that you get from people, most virus isolates, don't grow very well, what you do is you pick your strain and then you make a reassortant with a strain that you know grows really well in eggs. And then you make sure that the, the genes for the HA and the NA come from the clinical isolate that you want to protect against, and then the, all the other ones come from the high-yielding strain. So this is done every year. You make a reassortant, and then you get that to grow really well uh, in eggs. So the current vaccine is a trivalent preparation. It has three components. It has a 2009 H1N1 strain. This is the strain that emerged that year, the pandemic swine origin influenza strain. There is also another type A strain, an H3N2. These viruses continue to circulate. And then there's an influenza B strain. All right. Yes? No, it's not terribly cheap. It's not less than a dollar per dose. Um, you need one egg per, per dose. So that's 150 million eggs you need. And the production is, is complicated, the inoculation of the eggs and the harvesting and the inactivation. So I, I think the cell culture vaccine would be cheaper. But there's an even cheaper alternative coming up, which we'll talk about. Uh, subunit vaccines, you break the virus into components, and then you immunize with purified components. So in one, one version, you can clone the gene for, let's say, HA of flu, you clone it, you express it somewhere, bacteria, yeast, insect cells, cell culture, you have to decide what is best. So you purify the protein and use that as an immunogen. And typically, the antigen is a capsid protein or a membrane protein, uh, which you know will provide uh, protection. Antibodies against it will provide uh, protection. Subunit vaccines have some advantages. Um, there are no viral genomes that can replicate. It's just a purified protein. There's no possibility of contamination with infectious virus or foreign proteins. I shouldn't really say there is no con possibility because whenever you produce something in a cell, there's always a possibility of a virus contaminating it, depending on how you purify it. But it's less likely to be contaminated than a virus that you grow uh, in cells. Some disadvantages, these are expensive because the purification is costly. Typically, the antigenicity is low. It's just a single protein. And usually, the virus itself makes a great antibody response. But when you start breaking it into proteins, not as good. These typically make good antibodies, but not T cells, which you may need depending on the virus. And the delivery system isn't great. Most of these have to be injected. And as I say, we're trying to get away from that. They all have one problem, is that the proteins don't replicate, of course. They're not viruses. They don't infect cells. They don't send out a danger signal. Remember how we talked about how viruses interact with the innate immune system. The dendritic cells sense the infection, and they go on to tell the T cells something is going on. Well, protein antigens don't do that very well, because they don't replicate. And a good example of this is a vaccine against respiratory syncytial virus, which was produced uh, in the early 60s. It was a failure because it didn't induce a good danger signal. We'll talk about that in a moment. When you use a, pu a pure protein as an immunogen, you often require an adjuvant. And what this does is to stimulate inflammation. Remember, inflammation, the production of cytokines that amplify the adaptive response. A pure protein antigen is often not good at doing this. So we put adjuvants in to make better inflammation. And before we talk about adjuvants, let me tell you a little bit about this respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. This was published in, in 2008. Lack of antibody affinity maturation due to poor toll-like receptor stimulation leads to enhanced respiratory syncytial virus disease. 
So in a natural infection with respiratory syncytial virus, the virus binds to toll-like receptors on the cell surface. And these are the sensors of the innate immune system. The toll-like receptors say, ah, there's a foreign virus here. They signal the innate immune system. In addition, when the virus gets into cells, it makes double-stranded RNA, which is also sensed. Uh, and all of these things uh, make a really strong innate response and consequently a great adaptive response, which means really good antibody affinity maturation, high affinity antibodies. So the innate response is, is crucial for getting really good antibodies. When they made the vaccine, they inactivated with formalin, and they didn't know this at the time, but it turned out to be a really poor ligand for the toll-like receptors. It no longer stimulated toll-like receptors, so you got very poor innate responses to this vaccine, and you got very low affinity antibodies produced. So just because the innate response wasn't stimulated, you got really bad antibodies. These bound the virus, but they didn't neutralize it. And in fact, they led to uptake of the virus into FC receptor bearing cells, very much like dengue, and more severe disease. Okay, so now we know that the problem is toll-like receptor stimulating, and we can make a vaccine that better does that. All right, what are adjuvants? These are substances that stimulate uh, early processes in, in uh, recognition, particularly inflammation. They make better inflammation, right? All those signals of inflammation, the cytokines released, they help make better antibody responses. They help make a more, they also help produce a more robust response with less antigen. So uh, sometimes with an adjuvant, you can use less antigen, which may be good in some cases. There are at least three ways that we know that they work. We're always developing new ones. Uh, they sometimes present antigens as particles, depending on the adjuvant. Uh, they localize the antigen to the site of inoculation for a longer period so they can stimulate inflammation better. And also they have direct stimulation of, of the innate response by improving overall inflammation. Uh, in the U.S., we use um, two different kinds of adjuvants in our vaccines. We use aluminum salts in the hepatitis B virus vaccine and, and ASO4 in one of the human papillomavirus vaccine. This is aluminum hydroxide and monophosphorolipid A. So it's a mixture of two different things. We don't use adjuvants in any other vaccines. In Europe, uh, some uh, influenza vaccines have adjuvants in them. Some successful subunit vaccines, well, the hepatitis B vaccine is a good subunit vaccine. This consists nowadays of the capsid protein produced in yeast. So the gene for the protein was cloned, inserted into yeast. It's expressed. The protein assembles into empty particles. Uh, and no adjuvant is needed for this because it's the particle. Even though it's just one protein, it makes a particle, which is a natural adjuvant. You don't need to add anything to this vaccine. Uh, here is the hepatitis B virus particle. And the uh, particles that are made when you just express the capsid protein are shown here, two different kinds. So, of course, you don't have the genome, the viral DNA, and so forth, or the membrane, but you make these particles which are quite immunogenic. So that's a very good vaccine. The human papillomavirus vaccines, there are two of them now, Gardasil made by Merck, which is against four serotypes produced in yeast. So you express a single capsid protein of the virus. Here's the variant up here. The major capsid protein is called L1. You take the gene encoding it, you make it, you express it either in yeast or in insect cells, which is what GlaxoSmithKline does to make its version, Cervarix, made in insect cells. Uh, you then uh, express that. You get virus-like particles. You purify them, and then you can immunize individuals. These are injected vaccines. Uh, the Cervarix is given with an adjuvant. The Gardasil is not. And so these are anti-cancer vaccines. They protect you against different kinds of cancer induced by these human papillomaviruses. And we recently had a TWIV with uh, Michelle Osborne, who works on papillomaviruses. And uh, if you're interested in hearing more from her, you should listen to that. <coughs> Let's move on to live, in quotes, attenuated vaccines. These are vaccines where viral replication occurs and stimulates an immune response. Sometimes the virions are contained to the site of replication. Uh, infection typically induces a mild disease or none. Here is what a live virus vaccine does compared to a killed virus vaccine. So when you inject 
your first dose of killed virus vaccine, you have an immune response, it wanes, you then give a second or a third booster to get substantial responses. But an, an infectious virus vaccine amplifies itself. You give one dose, the virus replicates, and you get substantial immune responses without multiple injection. How do you make such viruses? How do you take a virus which causes disease in people and then derive one that doesn't cause disease? We still haven't been able to do this in a directed fashion. In other words, we still can't say, let's make a mutation in this gene and it will cause the virus not to be uh, pathogenic. Most of our vaccines are made empirically. You take a virus and you grow it in certain conditions and hope that at some point you lose virulence of the virus. So here's an example. You take a pathogenic virus from a patient and you grow it in cultured cells. Then you may grow it in another kind of cell. And as you grow it in cell to cell, the virus acquires mutations, say, that make it grow better in a monkey cell compared to a human cell. And now when you infect people, it doesn't grow well, and it may be a candidate for a vaccine. So this is a crude approximation of the strategy. It's entirely empirical. You have to just do a hit and miss approach and, and hope for the best. Poliovirus, the poliovirus infectious vaccines are a great example of this. Um, even though we had a killed virus vaccine, IPV, an activated polio vaccine, many people felt that that would not eliminate polio because it didn't mimic a natural infection. So a number of individuals uh, worked on attenuating viruses to make an infectious vaccine. In 1952, uh, Hillary Koprowski and John Enders, John Enders, of course, the first person to show that you could grow polio in cell culture, showed that you could pass the virus in cell culture and it would lose virulence for animals. This is the strategy I just told you. They actually showed this in 1952. And so a number of individuals worked on this. Albert Sabin, uh, his three strains of OPV were licensed in the US in 1961. And this is an example of how he derived one of the three serotypes. This is the type three component. Uh, he took the original polio isolate, which was from a fatal case of polio, and look what he did. He passed it intracerebrally in monkeys 21 times, eight times in monkey testicle cultures, 39 times in monkey kidney cultures, three plaque purifications. And at each step, he would take this virus and inject it into monkeys and ask, is it pathogenic? And eventually, he got a virus that wasn't. And that became the vaccine strain. All this, of course, is done in the 1950s. There's no molecular biology. There's no cloning. There's no sequencing. The only thing he knew was when you inject it into a monkey, it did not cause paralysis. And eventually, these were put into people in clinical trials. And these were the poliovirus vaccines. Now, in the 1980s, when we got the ability to sequence DNA and other genomes, we then could sequence Sabin strains and ask, how did they differ from the viruses that he started with? And that's shown here. In fact, there are very few changes in these vaccine strains compared to the viruses that he made them from. In fact, there are two of the three serotypes. There are only two changes. And if we were licensing this vaccine today, the FDA would look at this and say, not enough changes. You can't have this as a vaccine. But back then, we didn't have sequencing, so they were licensed. All, th all uh, three of these vaccines, by the way, have a change in the five prime non-coding region of the viral RNA. I don't know if you remember that, but that's an extensively folded region that has an iris in it, an internal ribosome entry site. It has a lot of stem loop structures. Remember, this is the polio genome. This is the coding region in the middle. It has a five prime non-coding region. It's extensively folded. And these mutations in three vaccine strains are all in this five prime non-coding region, in particular in this little stem loop section here, number, number V. And they're shown here, the type one, the type two, and the type three changes that attenuate the virulence of poliovirus. So this virus is ingested, this vaccine you drink. You get a little bit of liquid in a capsule, you drink it. It goes to your intestine, it multiplies there. You get nice intestinal immunity that mimics a real infection. The virus also gets into your blood where it makes antibodies and memory there as well. And then you are protected from infection. And as OPV, remember, only protected your blood from circulation of virus, OPV does both. It blocks infection at the mucosal surface and within the blood. 
Now, the inactivated vaccine was supplanted by the oral vaccine in 1961. That led to the elimination of polio uh, in the U.S. Unfortunately, the vaccine, the attenuated vaccine, can also cause polio. This is called vaccine-associated polio. And it was recognized actually from its very beginnings that when you feed people these vaccine strains, what they excrete in their stools is more neurovirulent than what you give them. So you can feed people polio vaccine, you take what they shed, you put that into monkeys, and that's more neurovirulent than what you started with. And when, when these vaccines were first used in Eastern Europe in the 60s, uh, there were paralytic cases associated with immunizing individuals with them. And as we eliminated polio from the U.S., the last case of wild polio in the U.S. was 1979. After that, the only polio in the U.S. was vaccine-associated paralytic polio, or VAP. And the rate was 1 per 1.4 million doses of vaccine distributed. There were about seven to eight such cases per year in the U.S., and that's why by 2000 we decided to switch back to the inactivated vaccine because the only polio was caused by the vaccine itself, which obviously was not acceptable. And so this is a nice graph which shows you the progress of polio eradication in the U.S. These are, this is the number of paralytic cases here on the y-axis, and this is the year. So we're starting in 1961. These bars are the vaccine-associated polio cases. So the black bars are the polio cases caused by the vaccine. The line is the total number of polio in the U.S. So you can see in the early 60s, there was a lot more wild polio. But then as we eliminated indigenous polio, here's the last case in 1979, 20 cases in an Amish community in Pennsylvania. Then 1980 on on, no more wild polio. The only polio was caused by the vaccine. So 2000, we switched to the killed vaccine. Now no more polio in the U.S. Why does the vaccine cause polio? Because when you ingest it, it replicates in your intestine and it rapidly reverts. So those few mutations, remember that Albert Sabin selected for to make the virus attenuated, they rapidly revert as the virus replicates in your gut. And this was first determined in 1985 by Phil Miner, who was a virologist in the UK. And he and his wife had their first child. And at two months of age, what happens? They get their first dose of oral polio vaccine. So Phil collected every diaper that his child produced for the first three months. And he brought them into the lab and he scraped off the feces and isolated polio from it and sequenced it. And this, he published this in Nature. So this is his child, David Miner. This is the bulk of the, the paper. And what happens with David is that at, at 24 hours, he sh this is for the type 3 vaccine only we're looking at. At 24 hours, the vaccine is fine. It has a U at 472. At 31 hours, it's still fine. But look, at 35 hours, now you have a mixture of viruses with a U and a C. The C is the base that makes this virus virulent at this position. So within a few days, David Miner was shedding fully virulent polio virus. If you inject this virus into monkeys, it paralyzes them, which is shown by these high numbers here. In subsequent studies, this has been shown to happen in every child that gets oral polio vaccines. All three strains revert during multiplication in your digestive tract. So that's why some kids get polio when they get the polio vaccine, because it's genetically unstable. Amazingly, most kids are fine, but one, one per 1.4 million get paralyzed. I don't know why. We don't really understand why that occurs. I think they have a suboptimal innate response and a genetic predisposition to that, but that's never been proven. All right, there's another live va or infectious vaccine I want to tell you about. It's a flu, flu vaccine. It's called flu mist. This is a live attenuated trivalent, three strains, nasally administered. Anybody ever have flu mist here? You have. They put a little thing and shoot it up your nose and you're supposed to inhale, right? And a lot of it drips out, and falls on your shirt. Yeah. But this is a nice way to do it if you don't like needles. Uh, this is also made in eggs, though, so if you have egg allergies, you can't get it. But it uh, has an interesting uh, origin. These are the, the three strains that are in it. It is also reassortance of a master donor strain. 
So this master donor was developed by passing virus at low temperature uh, until it, it replicated really well at low temperature, but not at higher temperatures. And then what you do is you re reassort this strain so that you have the genes for the HA and NA from whatever your current strain is. You make a reassortant. And these viruses are cold adapted and temperature sensitive. So they prefer multiplying at a low temperature, which is your upper tract. They don't go into your lung because once they go there, the temperature is too high and they don't replicate. So that's why they don't cause disease. They stay up in the upper tract and give you immunity. So they're cold adapted, temperature sensitive. They replicate only in your nasopharynx and there they pr produce protective immunity. So these are limited in their distribution because a lot of doses are not made yet, but eventually I think more and more of this will be made, especially as we move to the cell culture production. This is just to show you how these strains are isolated. It's, it's complicated. So you start with a parental virus that is whatever virus you want to immunize against. Then you have this master donor virus, which is cold adapted and temperature sensitive. This was developed at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, actually in the 60s. So this is old technology. These are reassorted. And then you select for viruses with the HANNA of your virus and then everything else from this donor strain. You go through a number of egg passages and harvests and eventually you, you make a big bulk process and you get your vaccine. So it's a complicated process, which is why it's not cheap. Now, what about future vaccines for flu? This is one that I really like and this is one you can make in plants. So, if you just express the HA of influenza virus in cells, the HA, that glycoprotein on the surface, what you get are particles made, like this. The HA is enough to stimulate budding of a membrane particle that has the HA glycoprotein embedded in it. So these are virus-like particles. And these are quite immunogenic, and they, they can protect you against influenza. This can also be done in plants. You can express the HA of flu in a plant. And this is very cheap when you do this. One square meter of plants makes 20,000 doses of vaccine. So this is like a square meter, this thing right here. And they do this in tobacco plants because tobacco plants you can easily put genes into. Uh, and they're, so they're genetically manipulable. A square meter of tobacco plants makes 20,000 doses of vaccine <coughs> at under 20 cents a dose. So this is significantly cheaper. And uh, my colleague Dixon de Palmier is a big proponent of making vertical farms in cities, growing your crops hydroponically. So we thought that this would be, this is Dixon here. You'll meet him later in the course. And uh, we think we should, that he should make uh, these flu vaccines in his vertical farms. And it would be even cheaper. So here's an example of why it would be really good to make this vaccine in plants. So uh, let's say you have a new pandemic strain of influenza virus right here. So in, in 2009, we had a new strain emerge, all right? So then um, you start making your egg-based vaccine, and it takes you about six months to start putting egg-based vaccine into the market. You have to make a reassortant with a high-yielding egg vaccine. You have to produce it in eggs and inactivate it. You have to test it a bit. So you're six months in. Uh, by then, the pandemic first wave is already beginning. Here's the peak of disease. And uh, you've missed it by the time you get your egg vaccine into the population. And in fact, it turns out that for 2009, all the vaccines that we released were really too late to make an impact on uh, H1N1 disease. On the other hand, if you make it in plants, you can immediately get the sequence of the HA from your first isolate and you can within three months have a plant-based vaccine supply because all you have to do is express it in plants. It's very easy to purify from the particles from the plant fluids and you can have an egg-based vaccine. So these are now in clinical trials in people. There are a number of publications already describing their immunogenicity. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there will be. That's why they have to put it in many, many people before it will be licensed. But in the early phase one safety tests, they're, they're nothing so far. But we'll see, because it is an extract of a tobacco plant. So you can imagine that there might be something in it. So all of the vaccination we've talked about leads to one question. Can you eradicate viral diseases? And as we said earlier, 
Uh, smallpox was eradicated in 1978. There's no more smallpox. It's the only major human disease to be eradicated. And what do you need to eradicate a virus infection? Well, two main features. One, you should have just one host that the virus replicates in. So smallpox only replicates in people. Polio only replicates in people. If it replicates in animals, then it's very difficult to eradicate it, because even if you get rid of the virus in people, it's still in the animals. And you have to induce lifelong immunity to vaccination. So if you have these two, you can possibly eradicate. So measles is another candidate for eradication. It just replicates in people, and vaccination induces lifelong immunity. Now, this is a very interesting situation we're in with smallpox. Since it's been eradicated, and there's no more smallpox, there are just two more stocks of virus, there are two stocks of virus left in the world, one in CDC in Atlanta and one in Russia. And so the WHO has said for years we should destroy all these virus stocks because maybe a terrorist would get a hold of them and use them for nefarious purposes. We don't get immunized against smallpox anymore because there's no disease, but we're all susceptible. So it would be a good, uh, the, the argument is that it would be a, a bioterror weapon and they should be destroyed. Uh, whether or not this is going to happen or not, I don't know. It's been debated for 10 years and it's not clear what will happen. I have my own views, but I'll save you from those. Uh, anyway, um, I wrote, I put up a poll uh, some time ago on my blog, should smallpox virus be destroyed, yes or no? Because it turns out that it's not just a vial of smallpox, it's actually a collection of about 200 different strains that have been isolated from all over the world with different pathogenicities, they've never been sequenced, so it's really a resource. So with that in mind, I put up this, and so far I think there are 375 uh, people who have answered, and most of them are saying not to destroy the, the virus stock. What would you say, Saul, yes or no? No, no, yes or no. That's what you have to answer. The poll, you're not destroyed. The problem is you're a virologist than I am, and most of the people who go to this are, vi are interested in viruses, so they're more likely to say no. So anyway, I, I think it's a resource. In fact, if he's right. If, if WHO said destroy them, I, my feeling is the U.S. and Russia would say sure, and then they would never do it. And then you would have hidden stocks, which are even harder to police than public ones. So I say leave them there in the safe or wherever it is that they are, and maybe someday they'll be useful. Uh, polio is on the track to be eradicated. WHO has made a resolution to eradicate in 1988. They thought we would be done by 2000, uh, and they wanted to stop immunizing. Now we're, we're in 2011 now, and we still have polio globally. Um, the problem is that polio reverts to a form that causes polio, whereas smallpox vaccine never reverts to, to cause smallpox. And we know that there are these vaccine-derived polio viruses all over the world, so the WHO has said if we ever eradicate polio, we're going to stop immunizing, all right? And the assumption is that once you stop immunizing, the live vaccine goes away. But that's turned out to be incorrect. Uh, but let me show you first the effect of the polio eradication campaign, 1988 about 400,000 cases globally, and now uh, 2008 just in five countries, among them Nigeria, India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And last year there were less than 2,000 cases. So we've made a lot of problem, a lot of progress. The problem is that there are periodically outbreaks of polio which are caused by the vaccine. And there have been recent ones in these countries caused by circulating vaccine-derived viruses. So. In the Western Hemisphere, polio was eradicated a number of years ago, so immunization becomes, the levels become low. Countries say, there's no polio globally, why do I have to immunize? So then you have pockets of susceptible individuals in various places, and then a vaccine-derived polio is introduced and it causes disease. And so these are strains, of course, that can spread in the population and they can cause disease. They're also very interesting in immunocompromised people who receive polio vaccine at two months of age, just like everyone else, and they can't clear it. They shed it for 10, 15 years or longer, and they're fine. They're not sick at all, so you don't even know where they are. And a number of these individuals have been responsible for sparking these outbreaks of polio in these countries. So basically, 
uh, if you stopped immunizing one day, you would have a similar situation. You would have an increasing number of non-immune individuals, and then the vaccine-derived viruses would eventually cause an outbreak. Uh, so you can't stop immunizing, in my view. What you have to do is you have to basically vaccinate against the vaccine. So this is a paradoxical situation now. We've used an infectious vaccine, but it can cause disease that it was meant to eradicate. So when we're done Im eradicating the disease, we have to then immunize with something else to get rid of the vaccine. So my view is to start immunizing with the inactivated vaccine. And that's a problem because it costs more and we don't know if it works everywhere, but then monitor the environment and make sure the vaccine-derived polio viruses are gone before you stop immunizing one day. It's a really interesting question because IPV being expensive will probably just be used in developed countries, whereas the underdeveloped nations which are depending on WHO to buy them vaccine, as soon as no more OPV is available, they probably won't immunize at all. So I suspect that under those conditions, there will be outbreaks again uh, one day. For that reason, we have to stockpile polio. There's still lots of polio in research labs like my own. There are stored samples that have polio in them, but we don't know it. Uh, and you can easily make polio from the sequence. It's only 7,442 bases in length, and that's pretty easy to have synthesized and make virus from. So you assume that you'll never be able to get rid of all the sources of polio so you have to stockpile some vaccine. A and even if you are able to eradicate polio one day, as long as you have the sequence, you can make it. And you can do this for any virus, of course. Polio is easy because it's short, but even smallpox with a, a several hundred thousand base pair genome, you could do it as well. So eradication is a concept, but in practice, it really doesn't ever happen. <laughs>